Good morning, GCN. Please stand and join us in worship. Oh, I still have mine. Good morning. <laughs> um, we are so thankful to be together this morning and to be all together. Um, we've got some scripture that's going to be read, so I want to invite my people who are reading scripture to come up and join me. Would you stand as we hear the word of the Lord this morning? As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it, and and we'll send it back here shortly. They went and found a coat outside in the street, tied at a doorway as they united it. Some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that coat? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. One day brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it. He sat on it. 
Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut on in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed the kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Oh. So, so good. Um, kids, you are going to be on the move. Um, so you are, you are dismissed to go to Kids on the Move. I want to extend a big welcome to you this morning, whether you're joining us here um, in person or you're joining us online or you're just coming on in. Good morning. Happy Palm Sunday. And you can go ahead and take a seat. <laughs> I want to say, um, say a special welcome if this is your first time here joining us. Uh, welcome into GCN. We don't always have foliage, um, but this morning we are, we are happy to celebrate um, Palm Sunday. Uh, up on the screen here you see the Connect card. This is a reminder whether you're brand new here or you've been going here for a long time, uh, we still need to continue to connect. And so uh, make sure to scan that to, um, to, to see what's on there. There are things like prayer requests, ways to get involved, lots of, lots of good things there. And so um, if you've never scanned that QR code, I think today's your day. Um, check it out. <laughs> There's lots of, lots of things there, and it's great to be able to connect that way. If you're new here, we want to say welcome, and we have a gift for you at the welcome kiosk. That's right through those main doors that you came in. Um, we want to make sure that you are welcomed, um, and we love to give you more information about how to get connected um, at GCN. Well, if today's Palm Sunday, pop quiz, that means next week is... Easter, good job, guys. How'd you know? How'd you know? Um, <laughs> Easter is next week, and um, we have cards for you to welcome people um, with. If we were to go around this room, I'm sure each of us would be able to share stories about how people influenced our lives, our walk with Jesus. They either um, shared us, shared God's love with us, or invited us to something. And so I want to encourage you to be praying for maybe some bravery this week to invite somebody who, who needs to be here at Easter next week, who needs to hear the good news that uh, Jesus has died and has risen again. Um, be thinking of that. Grab a card or two um, on your way out. They have them in English and Spanish, one on each side. And so um, invite some people around you. Um, after, after service, well, before service next week, we've got some amazing kids programming happening, um, Easter egg hunt things like that. And then after service, there may or may not be some special guests hanging out outside. I don't know. I can't confirm or deny that, but I encourage you to stick around after service next week. Um, but before we get to celebrate Easter, we are people that recognize um, that such a huge part of the story of Jesus and Jesus's love for us is this sacrifice. Um, and so there is no resurrection without a cross. There is no empty tomb on Easter Sunday morning without um, the cross on Good Friday. And so we remember that. There's a, there's a Good Friday service on, um, on Friday at 7 p.m. Um, we encourage you to come out. It'll be a time of, of worship and of prayer and of sharing stories. Um, it's going to be a really impactful time. So I want to encourage you to come on out for that. Switching tones, um, Mega Sports Camp is coming up um, in June. There are the dates there, and there's um, an opportunity to volunteer. My first like big GCN event as a pastor here uh, was Mega Sports Camp, and it was an amazing opportunity to get to, to join in and serve. Um, maybe you have some unique ways that God could use you. I want to encourage you to think about volunteering and getting those um, getting those details on your calendar. The theme is Blaze a Trail. Ooh, Blaze a Trail. So make sure to put that on um, your radar. Put that on your calendar. All right. I have one more pop quiz for you all. Are you ready? Well, actually, I'm the youth pastor here, so I'm going to ask you a question. All right. We're going to take a poll. If you think that Reese's peanut butter cups are a good, um, are a good Easter candy, you're going to point to this giving box over here. Does everyone see the giving box? All right. If you think the Easter or the, a good Easter candy is the peanut butter cups, you're going to point at this one. If you think that the, the Easter egg shaped Reese's peanut butter cups are better, uh, you're going to point over at this giving box. When I say count of three, all right? So your choices are the, the regular peanut butter cups or the Easter eggs. If you have an allergy, I need you to pretend with us, all right? <laughs> make, make an educated decision. All right. On three, I'm going to need you to point to which giving box you like better, the, the peanut butter cups or the Easter eggs. All right. You ready? One, two, three. I see some people pointing to both. 
Well, guess what, guys? Now you know where the giving boxes are. So we have we have shifted our, our giving. Those are the two spots. Um, and I am gonna I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, need you to put your offering in whichever one you voted for. <laughs> Actually, just kidding. There's no way to fact check that. But um, there are different ways to give, and we want to encourage you um, to continue to be generous. You can see the ways to sign up or to to sign up to give or to register online and then also here in person. Would you stand with me and let's, um, we're going to continue to worship, but would you greet each other?
for this time of worship and of praise. As we enter Holy Week, we pray, Lord, that our hearts are focused on you. You are gracious and so full of mercy. Thank you for loving us so much that you gave your son to save us. Let your unfailing love surround us, Lord. Lord, because our hope is in you alone. Good morning. Good morning. Some more excited than others this morning. Um, a few summers ago, uh, Jenny and I climbed to the top of the Manitou Incline. It's a mountain in Colorado, and uh, I'll show you a picture to give you an idea. It is uh, one mile of stairs straight up the side of a mountain. Uh, technically, it's 2,744 stair steps made out of railroad ties, but who's counting, right? Um, it has a 2,000 foot increase in elevation. And so what I'm saying is you better eat your Wheaties before you climb this mountain. Like it's a pretty, pretty intense um, workout. But the payoff is making it to the top, and I'll show you just to prove, prove it to you. There we are. We made it uh, to the top, and, and part of the thrill is just the accomplishment, but the big part of it is the view from the top. And uh, I, I'll, I checked my phone. I did not have any pictures that I felt like did it justice, so uh, I, I borrowed some from the internet. Okay, so some other people got some beautiful pictures Um, from the top. Pretty incredible for sure. But there's something about climbing a mountain that produces this anticipation and this longing for what's coming ahead. Um, So I want you to hang on to that thought for just a moment and and let me add my welcome to you. Happy Palm Sunday. Um, Feliz Domingo de Ramos. Okay, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. Thank you. Thank you, Eric, for that, like literally five minutes before service, got the tutorial. So we're five days away from uh, the cross of Good Friday, and we're one week out from the empty tomb of Resurrection Sunday. By the way, who you bring in with you uh, next week? That would be a great Sunday to invite people to join you. Uh, but wow, th- there sure is a lot that happens between this Sunday and next Sunday in the life of Jesus, correct? Um, So if you have a Bible, you can meet me uh, right next to a fig tree, just after a donkey ride, uh, Mark chapter 11, and we'll get there in just a minute. What we call Palm Sunday was actually the first day of Passover. Uh, Jerusalem at that time had a population of around 25,000 people, but during Passover, it would swell to nearly half a million people. kind of like D.C. during those cherry blossom days uh, and the spring breakers coming in on those field trips we went this past week. Pretty full, pretty full. The reason Jerusalem would get so full is because people from all over the world, uh, the known world, the region, would make their pilgrimage back to the whole, holy city um, and to the temple. And this is where I want to come back to that mountain for a moment. Uh, I'll show you a topographical map. Uh, so you guys know how to, how to get there, okay? So um, Jesus and his disciples were traveling from Jerusalem, or from Jericho to Jerusalem, and it's about an 18-mile journey. You can kind of make it out on the highlighted trail there. Jericho had an elevation of around like 800 feet below sea level, and Jerusalem had an elevation of around 2,500 feet above sea level. Don't worry, I did the math. It's about a climb of uh, 3,300 feet, uh, you know, all on foot. And so um, you can kind of see that Jerusalem is the highest point in the region, and at the peak of Jerusalem is the temple. Um, So no matter where you're traveling from, you got to go up 
to get to Jerusalem. You got to travel up to get to the temple. Uh, When I was a kid going on road trips, we would sing like the wheels on the bus go round and round or uh, 99 bottles of root beer on the wall. That was my family. Um, I'm one of those families. But Jewish kids would sing these psalms of ascent. It was like this anticipation for what was ahead up in Jerusalem. Okay, one of those psalms of ascent is Psalm 118, and it's pretty unique because it's the entrance liturgy. And so they would sing it uh, right as they're approaching Jerusalem. So these people, they've been traveling, you know, for days, and uh, you're getting pretty exhausted by this point. But then they kind of round the bend and they see Jerusalem, the holy city, the temple in the distance. That temple is like, you know, one of these wonders of the world. And this song, Psalm 118, is like their walk-up song to the city. It's like their, it's like their hype song. Um, In my, in my mind, I'm imagining the theme to Rocky, okay? Um, It's the eye of the tiger, it's the thrill of the fight. That's all you get on Palm Sunday. Uh, Come back next week. (laughs) Um, Just kidding. And so their adrenaline is pumping, this uh, psalm of ascent. And as they walk into the city, it it jogs their memories and it jogs their emotions. And here's the reason why. Uh, It's because they're celebrating the greatest moment in Israelite history. They're celebrating the moment when God delivered his people Uh, out of Egypt after 400 years of slavery. And and so here they are now, and they're under Roman occupation. And so all they can think and pray is, God, would you do it again? Like, deliver us again. We need you all over again. We need a Savior. Uh, You with me so far on this Palm Sunday? So the top uh, is about to blow off the city. And just when you think you can't, like build up any more anticipation. Here comes Jesus uh, riding into town on a donkey. And uh, everybody would have known that it was like this, this tip of the cap to uh, the prophet Zechariah in chapter 9. And their, their, like, their, their imaginations are just firing and their minds are just blown. And they, all they can think is this is it. This is the moment Uh, The deliverer has come, the Savior is here, and they begin to throw down those robes, and they're waving those palm branches, and and that walk-up song, Psalm 118, is about to hit its climax, and they just belt out the lyrics. We've already sang it a couple of times today, but they say, Hosanna, which means uh, save us. Hosanna. Uh, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So that's Palm Sunday. Um, We're T minus four days until the arrest of Jesus. We're five days until his crucifixion. And and so uh, now we pick it up the day after Palm Sunday, Monday of Holy Week. Uh, here Here we go. Mark chapter 11, verse 12. The next day as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Uh, I find this verse to be one of the more relatable verses about Jesus in the Gospels, right? Um, Anybody hungry out there? I've got some kids in our house who are always hungry. Um, So maybe a little, can I get a testimony here today? So Jesus, he's hungry, fully God and fully human. Next verse, uh, seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, He went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. Um, Okay, I think a fair question to ask right here is, uh, what is up with Jesus here, right? Um, Seems kind of like bizarre behavior. Getting angry at a tree for not producing fruit. But if you've you've read some of the Gospels, you know there's always more to the story, right? Um, 
So here, here's what let's do. Can we do that? Just kind of, can you lean in about an inch or two from where you are? Kind of lean in. Okay, a little bit of teaching right here. Thank you for being interactive. Lauren got us going with the Reese's, you know, the Reese's uh, pole there. So that helped us out. But uh, got to peel back some layers here. Uh, Jesus is a master teacher. That's like the understatement of the day. And if you read through the Gospels, you begin to notice that Jesus teaches by telling stories and he teaches by using object lessons. And so uh, he, he uses water at a well. He bends down and writes in the dirt. He points at birds and lilies. He bends down and washes his disciples' feet. And, and then here, Jesus scolds a fig tree, but it has nothing to do with the tree and everything to do with what's about to go down. Um, so in the Old Testament, a fig tree is almost always represented, uh, is almost always representative of uh, Israel, the people of God. And then the fruit on a fig tree is almost always a metaphor for the temple. And so Jesus, with this story, with this, with this acting out, is kind of setting up a hyperlink back to the prophet Jeremiah. And none of that would have been lost on the disciples who are watching him. And for sure, none of that would have been lost on those first century readers coming across the gospel of Mark for the first time. So we, we read a story like this in the Gospels, and we can easily just read right past it, but this is for Jesus. I think it's like, it's brilliant um, with a British accent, okay? <laughs> brilliant. And so uh, I'm really, really expanding my uh, language abilities today, okay? So let's talk about fig trees for just a minute here. Um, I know you wanted to talk about botany for a little bit, so there's maybe what that fig tree looked like. And it's pretty interesting because a fig tree, it puts out leaves in the spring and then it produces a, a crop of fruit, like this delicious fruit in late summer. And that's pretty normal. Uh, but here's the interesting thing about a fig tree. It, it also produces these little like nubby fruits in a, or in early spring. And so it's like kind of small, you don't eat it. It's bitter, it's tough, and uh, what those pre-crop fruits indicate is that the tree is healthy and that it has the potential to produce fruit. And, and so most scholars believe that when it says that this tree that Jesus came up to had nothing but leaves, then there was no pre-crop fruit. And so maybe you're kind of you know, picking up what Jesus is, is putting down here. The tree looks good on the outside, but there's no fruit, and there's no potential for fruit. So he's, he's teeing up what's about to happen next. And so here we go, verse 15. It's about to get good, okay? On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves, and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. As he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it into a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him, because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. I want to try to put ourselves in this story just a little bit. So I'll show you a picture of the temple to try to help us out. And uh, I don't know that this picture does it justice. Um, I don't know how big that temple looks to you. I, I was surprised to find this out. It's about the size, the temple court, it's about the size of 30 football fields like side by side, back to back. And so it's nearly 40 acres, um, pretty, pretty huge. And, and so this is Passover week, so it wouldn't be empty like that. We're talking thousands of people inside there, um, hundreds of booths set up, buying and selling animals. 
First century historian Josephus said that during just one week of Passover, uh, there was nearly 255,000 lambs uh, bought, sold, and sacrificed in the temple. So this, this is kind of hard for our like, 21st century imaginations to conceive of, right? Uh, but but try, to, try to imagine the sights. Uh, try to imagine the sounds. Let me hear your best sheep impression. Come on. Bah, there we go. And try to imagine the smells. Come on, right? We know what, yeah. yeah. So the selling of those animals was, was necessary um, because if you were traveling for seven days on foot um, up a mountain, you're not going to want to haul an extra animal with you, right? Uh, not only would it be extra, like, to haul with you, but it could also, it could get eaten by another animal. It could get injured. And the problem with that is this, um, sacrificial animals had to be perfect, unblemished. And so the merchants at the temple this day and the people buying things at the temple, buying the sacrificial animals, uh, they're like, they're meeting a legitimate need. So that's not the issue. So this is key. The issue that Jesus is addressing isn't just that there is buying and selling of animals somewhere near the temple. Um, the issue that Jesus has is where the buying and the selling is taking place. And, and here it is. It's happening in the temple courts, a.k.a. the court of the Gentiles. Um, significance of that is this. This was the only part of the temple where the Gentiles, uh, all those who are not a part of the family, right? All, all those who are not the Jewish people. This is the only place where they could come and pray and worship and get as close as possible to the presence of God, which is in the Holy of Holies. In other words, it's the only place in the temple where those who are on the outside could be brought into the inside. And so it's hard to do that when it's cluttered. So there was a lot of religious activity going on that day in the temple, correct? But people who were far from God were not being brought near to God. And if you, if you want to know what grieves the heart of God, this is that. And so Jesus comes in and he, he shuts it down, at least for a bit. He's flipping over tables and benches. He's driving the people out. He, uh, John's gospel says he fashions a, a whip. That must have taken some time. Uh, and I don't know how long this went on for. Like, I think, like, like I imagine just like, you know, a couple minutes. Might have been much longer than that. And I, and I picture not just Jesus um, quoting Isaiah 56, not just one time, but I picture him like walking and driving people, flipping multiple times saying, my house will be a house of prayer for all nations, but you've made it into a den of robbers. My house will be a house of prayer for all nations, but you've made it into a den of robbers. All nations. It's for all nations. And this goes all the way back to Genesis 12. Uh, God's covenant with Abraham. Remember, God shows up to Abraham, uh, and he says, okay, it looks like you and uh, Sarah are barren, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build a nation out of you. Uh, many sons had father Abraham. And uh, he said, I'm not only going to just build a nation out of you, but I'm going to bless you. But it's not, it's not a blessing for you. I'm going to bless you so that all the other nations can be blessed. You are blessed to bless. And then Jesus shows up in the gospel and he pulls no punches. He makes it super clear. He says, I came to seek and save the lost. He says, I did not come to call the righteous to repentance. I came to call the sinners to repentance. He says, all people come to myself, that all people might come to God. That is the fruit I'll throw this out there. I, I bet most people that were in those temple courts that day, like in the outer courts, I bet that most of them 
had no idea that what they were doing was displeasing to God. And like, that could be a little alarming for us. Um, I bet they looked around and thought, okay, a uh, lot of people here. That seems like a good thing in the temple. Um, Passover, and so we, we got these animals sacrificing, so that seems like a good thing. Uh, we're taking care of this problem. You know, people are doing what they're supposed to. It looked good. And, and so this takes us all the way back to that fig tree, right? Because um, it can look good on the outside, but if there's no fruit, then you're missing the point. A few weeks ago, I came across uh, a clip from one of those old, I think it was a Dateline NBC episode. Any Dateline fans here? Nobody. <laughs> hey, thank you, Bob. Okay. We'll start a life group later, maybe. Dateline. <laughs> um, but on this show, they, they sent people into a hotel uh, with like a special kind of black light. And maybe you've seen something like this before where it's like a nice hotel and everything looks good. But then they turn that black light on and it's like, ooh. And so uh, a lot of bacteria, a lot of germs. And so one, one of the things they did was uh, they went up to a couple who had just checked in and they were like, okay, before you go to your room, let's, can we go and check things out first? And I, yeah, I'm watching it. I'm like, no. Don't do it, bro. <laughs> like, <laughs> nothing good is going to come from this. And so they, they said yes, and they went to the room, and it was fancy, like nice room. Hotel lights on, looks good. Uh, lights go off, black light goes on, and it's like glowing, you know? Like there's germs everywhere, on the bed, on the table, on the floor, everywhere. And as soon as the wife of this couple saw it, she was like, nope. <laughs> like, I'm out of here. Can't check out soon enough. Here, here's what's kind of fascinating about that episode. Um, everybody was fine with the room, as long as they didn't see the mess. Um, but as soon as you have to look at it, then all of a sudden you know there's a problem. Like you got to do something about it. It's kind of a side note here, but I think a really good practice for us always is, God, would you shine the black light on my life? Like, humble me. Uh, so easy to point fingers out, but God, would you, like, what is not pleasing in my life? I think it's a good practice for a church. Like, we can, a lot of religious activity, but God, what, what needs to be cleaned up? And so, Jesus shows up to the temple that day, and he, he shines that black light, right? Like, he, he exposes, he really exposes the temple. He, he exposes the whole sacrificial system and he's like you're missing the purpose uh, this was never intended to keep the insiders on the inside this was always meant so that all people might draw near to God uh, kind of getting ahead of myself here jumping the gun but you are a temple if you are in Christ this is first Corinthians 6 you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, add one more to the mix. We, church, are a temple. Not talking about this building, I'm talking about the people. And the same presence of God that was dwelling in the Holy of Holies in that temple now dwells in us. And guess what? Our purpose is also that all people might draw near to God. It is to seek and to save the lost. Historically, the church is always at its worst when it sees itself as an institution to protect. A lot of tragic stories there. The church is always at its worst when it sees itself as simply an organization to manage. But the church is always at its best when it sees itself as a mission of God to engage. And by mission, I mean the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world. Like, we, we are not called to have better worship services and better sermons and hold better meetings. <laughs> We're called to bless the neighborhood to the second and third generation in the name of Jesus. That's, that's who we are. That's what we do. We are 
an outer courts church. Um, a lot of examples of this, thankfully. Uh, anytime we hand a box of food to a family on Tuesdays in our food distribution line, that is outer courts ministry. Uh, every time we try to creatively imagine what the future holds for our partnership with Stewarttown Community Center. And, and be praying for that, the future of that, what that tutoring program looks like. like that is outer courts stuff. Um, nursing home presence, women's shelter. Uh, we we kind of turned a church cleaning day into an outer courts opportunity yesterday. I had a few dozen like local school students here helping us out. Um, I kind of love this. Um, several like leaders and even local schools and uh, organizations in Montgomery County um, come to GCN with needs that they're looking to be met. Um, I think that's like one of the highest compliments to who you are and what God is calling us to be. I'll I'll share a couple of examples here. Um, a couple weeks ago, uh, a, a worker, guidance counselor in a local school reached out, told us about a, a need for a family, transportation need for a teenage son who happens to have some special needs, periodically needs transportation to and from uh, their home to the school. Uh, learned a couple weeks ago about, uh, from Ben Wickner, the Equity Center, about a a mom and a young child who uh, need a host home for a couple of months while they're waiting on uh, their apartment to open up, kind of a financial need there. And, and, and please hear me, like we, we can't meet every need, but we sure can be an outer courts church. Um, and by the way, I don't want to overcomplicate this. It's also uh, praying for your neighbor, <laughs> praying for your coworker. I find that when I pray for people, it's crazy. Somehow, I find opportunities to share the love of Jesus with them when we're praying for them, right? And it's, it's loving people. It's opening our homes and uh, embodying the, uh, the hospitality of Jesus. It's embodying the good news of Jesus to the neighborhood. So we are an outer courts church. Okay. Can we, can we zoom way out now? Feel, we already we did accents, we've done, so let's, zzz, that's the zoom out, okay? Uh, many people, uh, myself included, have a tendency to read the Old Testament um, as a collection of stories about major events and heroes of the faith. And so, you know, we study like the lives of Abraham or Esther or David, and we study events like the flood or, um, you know, the, the burning bush or crossing the Red Sea, and we, we kind of focus in on those. And please hear me, there are lessons to be learned in each one of those events, but I would suggest that it's reading it wrong, <laughs> and maybe not wrong, but incomplete, because each person and each personality, each event, I would argue, points to the person of Jesus. Like it all finds its fulfillment in Christ. And so Sally Lloyd-Jones, uh, the author of, I think, one of the best children's Bibles of all time, the Jesus Storybook Bible, just throwing it out there for parents. Uh, Sally Lloyd-Jones says it this way. She said, there are lots of stories in the Bible but all the stories are telling one big story, and all those stories point to Jesus. So you go all the way back to Mount Sinai. Smoke covers that mountain. Only, only Moses can go up to that mountain and meet with God. No one else can go. And the reason is because, like the glory of God, the presence of God is so powerful, so thick that it's like he's, he's the only one that can, that can be up there. And so God gives Moses the tablets, the commandments, and Moses comes down the mountain and at the base of the mountain, the people build an altar and offer a sacrifice to God, kind of this provisional atonement for their sins. 
And then the very next thing that God does is uh, give them like this, like, like an Ikea instruction manual for how to build a tent, right? If you've ever read that portion of uh, Exodus. It's how to build the tabernacle, which seems like an odd move for God, but it's strategic because the same presence of God that is dwelling on the top of Mount Sinai is now dwelling inside the tabernacle in that holy of holies. And so the tabernacle becomes this portable Mount Sinai. And so you see God, he's moving mountains now, right? And then you fast forward to King Solomon, and instead of a portable tabernacle, now it's a permanent temple. And it's built on that temple mount, Jerusalem. And just like the tabernacle, in the middle of that temple is the Holy of Holies, and it's covered by this thick veil, which kind of reminds us of that thick veil of smoke that covered Mount Sinai. And Once a year, only once a year, on the Day of Atonement, only one person, one person only, kind of like Moses, was the one person who could go up Mount Sinai. Only the high priest could enter into the Holy of Holies, and that high priest had to bring with him a, a spotless, sacrificial lamb. So maybe you're already connecting the dots, right? You're seeing what Jesus is doing here. So Jesus is standing in the temple in Mark 11, and he's not just quoting Isaiah 56, but he is embodying Isaiah 56. He is fulfilling Isaiah 56 when he says, my house will be a house of prayer for all nations. And like, what's he doing? He's saying, um, like, I am. <laughs> what all of this is trying to accomplish. He's saying, I, I am the great I am, is what he's saying. He's saying, I am the fulfillment of who Moses is. I, I am the fulfillment of what Mount Sinai was trying to accomplish. Uh, we don't have to climb a mountain to find God. God, good news. Uh, God came down the mountain to find you. Uh, he, he's saying, you know, I am the tabernacle. Jesus is the temple. Jesus is the court of the Gentiles. He's the one that showed up and said, "Um, all of you who are weary, come to me and I'll I'll give you uh, rest. Jesus is the great high priest, but he's also the perfect sacrificial lamb. Uh, Jesus is the way into the holy of holies, right? He, he, because on Good Friday, when Jesus is breathing his last breath, the, the curtain of that temple is torn in two from top to bottom. And so now it's not just that all of us have a way into the very presence of God. I think it's even better than that. Now the very Spirit of God is on the loose. Like there, there's not a place that you can go to get away from the presence of God, if only we would have eyes to see it. Amen? If only we would have like lives that would be open to it. Like God, shine your black light on me. Let me see if I can't bring this thing in. Jesus is the fulfillment of every covenant. Uh, We've called this series the God of Covenant. We've looked at those key covenants. Jesus is that. Jesus is the fulfillment of every promise that God ever made because no matter how many promises God makes, all those promises are yes and amen in Christ. Jesus is our mediator and our advocate. Jesus is the judge and the jury, not us. Thanks be to God. Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. He's the King of all kings. He's the Lord of all lords. He's the name above all names. It's all from him. It's all through him. It's all to him. So I'll say it in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up. I 
I don't know exactly what you heard today, but I sure am trusting the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Holy Spirit has a way of uh, speaking not just in our ears, but to our hearts. Um, here's what I know for sure. We are called to be a house of prayer for all nations. And there's like so much packed into that statement. Um, house of prayer. So what are we talking about? Like individuals, temples of the Holy Spirit? Or are we talking about like us, the church? Uh, yes, both. <laughs> like prayer is communion with God. Um, Prayer is so many things, but at least one of those things is it's making space for the Holy Spirit to enter in. It's making space for the presence of God to actually shine the light and show us what needs to be cleaned up. Um, prayer is not outlining our agenda to God. Prayer is getting into God's word and God's presence and saying, God, we need you to outline your agenda for us. Like, but also this... Um, it's not just mm, us receiving something from God. It's also, God, what are you doing in me so that I might be like drawing other people into the very presence of God? Like it's all, that's our, that's the fruit. That's the purpose. Like if you're wondering what your purpose is, woo has at least something to do with drawing people, all people, not away from God, but to God. Um, so like, forgive us, God, where that's not happening, but then change us. And his grace is so sufficient. Like, he'll change us. Um, so here, here's what let's do. I think these moments right here are a gift. I don't know about you, but so many times in my life can feel pretty cluttered, kind of like a Jerusalem temple at Passover. That metaphor wouldn't have worked 20 minutes ago, right? Um, can get so cluttered. God wants to like clean that up. Here, here's something I've wrestled with. I don't even know if my screen's still up there. I'll, I'll, I'll verbalize it. It's a question of, uh, God, what clutter is in my life? And then this, what, what distraction Oh, what is distracting you from centering your whole life around Jesus? Um, so I don't know what posture you want to take right now. In just a moment, we're going to come to the table. But before that, um, like, like maybe where you're sitting could be an altar. Uh, maybe you want to come up here. But I do know this, like God wants to do so much in us and through us. And now I am talking about us as a church. But we got to have like those spaces where we let, let God do what only he can do. So let's pray. God, we, we confess that so, so many times our lives can get quite, um, quite full and maybe we can even, maybe it could be full of good things. Maybe it can be you know, full of things that we, we look at it on the outside, it's like, oh, it looks pretty good. But God, would you look in our hearts and, and you know, not just, not, not just so that we can be clean. We certainly pray that, Lord, but for the sake of our purpose in this world, God, I pray that you would 
over and over again, like make us, make us new. It's all, it's all, it's all from you. It's all through you, but it's also all for you. And so, God, um, would you make us into a temple um, with those outer courts that's designed to just say, all people, every person that we could ever come into contact with, like, how, God, would you have us? draw all people to you. And it's not, it's not rocket science, I don't think, Lord. I think, I think you've given us everything that we need. And God, I just want to, anybody here that maybe feels limited by, I don't know, any, any like insecurity or anything that maybe just is, uh, causing them to believe that they are anything less than who you say they are. God, we, we pray, just in the name of Jesus, would you, would you heal that? Uh, in the places where there's just like brokenness that needs to be dealt with, again, not even just for ourselves, but because ultimately those are the things that get in the way of loving people with the love of Jesus. So God, heal our, our church where that's the case. For, forgive us where we've fallen short. Um, and God, meet us afresh and anew right now. Thank you for your grace. Thank you that by the power of your spirit, we read a story about, you know, Jesus, who is God, showing up in the temple. But the truth is, uh, long before we showed up in this room, by your spirit, you were here. Long before anybody woke up this morning, your spirit is already at work. Your grace has pursued us from the, before we could even conceive of you. So God, anyone here who's thinking that you're far and distant, um, that can be a feeling, but it's not reality. You are so near. The holy of hol- the very presence that contained in the holy of holies is now on the loose. So God, we receive like we receive your your spirit and all that comes with it, uh, forgiveness, healing, conviction of where we need that to happen. So God, shine that that light on us. We want to be a house of prayer for all nations, all people. We pray that in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 I'm going to ask those who, are, those who are serving to come now. And so in just a moment, we'll dismiss you by Rose and... You'll have the opportunity. All are invited to the table, by the way. Uh, None are compelled. All are invited who recognize, whew, I need God to shine that black light on me. (laughs) Like anyone who recognizes their need for God's grace. Um, And so as you come, you'll receive that piece of bread. You'll dip it in the cup of juice, and we'll receive uh, communion together. This is the body and blood of Christ. I think it takes on a special element this Sunday because we, we say on the night that our Lord was betrayed, well, that's just a few days from now, uh, Thursday, he was seated around his disciples. So the night that his own disciple is going to betray him, right? Uh, Jesus, the fulfillment of everything, God in the flesh is sitting before them. And what does he do? He, he says, uh, take and eat. He breaks the bread and he says, this is my body given over for you. He takes the cup and he says, this is the cup of the new covenant. This is for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink. And so this is our way of saying, God, we need more of you. Jesus, we need more of you. Holy Spirit, fill us. Um, And so in just a moment as the ushers dismiss you, let's come and let's receive that grace afresh and anew in our life.
Thank you for just this gift. We thank you for uh, help it not to become routine for us to thank you for uh, just the gift of you to us. So God, it, just all that that entails, like. You comfort us, but you also reveal things that aren't pleasing to, to us, but you don't like just leave us in shame. You meet us at that place in grace, and then you don't just like offer quick fixes, but you transform us from the inside out, and, and you grow us constantly, and your, your word is like this well that never runs dry. Like there's, there's nothing else in the world that satisfies like you. And so just the fullness of who you are, just thank you. <laughs> God, we 
just like even over again right now, I, I just want to surrender everything to you again, <laughs> over again. May that be the heartbeat of, of us, God, of this church. We are blessed to bless. We are you know, anointed by you to anoint others. We are called by you so that we can call others to you. May that be our heartbeat, Lord. We pray that in your name, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You guys know what next week is? Yeah, resurrection. Did you guys know? Do you know that we're having seven baptisms up here so far? I mean, I don't know. I don't think we have any answer. Um, and here, here's a pop quiz. Does anybody, can anybody uh, tell me where is the baptistry? Yeah, that's the, what's right, I'm standing on it. So when you come, um, hey, next, really, be thinking, be praying. I've got a list of about a dozen people. You know, be praying and thinking of who you want to invite uh, to join you next week. Not, not just, I don't know. I, I, my sense is most people are hungry, ultimately, for what can only be found in Christ. And so um, let's, let's be thinking about that. Good Friday service uh, right here, 7 p.m. We've talked about house of prayer. Like this is a time uh, when we say, let's practice what we preach. We'll be praying together, be entering into that story that changed the world together. Hope you'll come. Uh, all right, we, would you stand with me? In just a moment, we're going to leave this place, but we don't just say go. You are sent out from this place. Uh, and so we, we go in the hope of Jesus and by the power of his spirit. Um, if you're a first-time guest, we hope you'll stop by that uh, table right as you exit the doors. Um, we've got a gift for you. That's just a way for us to say, we love you, and so does Jesus. And then if you also, we've got some people that always every service are here to be praying with you. Don't rush past this time. So if you if there's anything that you need uh, to be prayed over, um, we hope that you'll come even right as we're right after the benediction song and come. This is a place of prayer. This is a house of prayer. Amen. So, um, man, you are loved. And as we leave from this place, leave as people who know that you are loved by God. Um, like he is, he is for you, not against you. Um, let's share that message with others. Amen. Let's sing that benediction song together. We sing.